Hey, welcome back, everybody. Once again, this is Mark Lawrence, and we're going against the spread on this week one of the college football card, a full week of college football on tap this week after week zero last week. And with that, we're going to welcome in our panel of experts to the show, as we always do, Victor King from the Playbook Totals Tip Sheet. Victor, how are you doing this particular week? Doing fantastic, Mark. Uh, we are looking forward to an all-college football uh, podcast here today. Before we get into the other guys' introductions, can I conclude the NFL preseason numbers because they are significant? Sure, I'd love to hear those. I'm sure well, again, be- last week in the NFL, week three of the preseason, another good week for the underdogs. It was the third consecutive week in which underdogs covered the spread at least 10 times. 10 and 6 last week, 10, 5, and 1 in week two. 10 and 6 in week one. Overall, a very good season for the doggies. 30, 17 and 1 ATS, 64%. Best uh, preseason for just flat out underdogs, dating all the way back to the 2008 season. And we touched on it very briefly. It was also the revenge of the overs last week in the final week of the NFL preseason. 11 out of 16 games and then going over the total much much different than those first two weeks in which there was only six overs and 26 unders last week in the nfl the average score 42.3 points per game compare that to 29.5 just the previous week so nfl games were about 14 points higher scoring in week three than they were in week two it still finished off with many more unders than overs but the law of averages and, of course, the fact that there was very, very good value last week propelled the NFL preseason to an 11-5 and over-under record. Uh, real good, Victor. And if you believe in the return to the norm, uh, that happened exactly what Victor just laid out in the NFL preseason with the NFL over-under totals. So if you were buried in the first week betting overs and you stayed with your game plan and bet the overs, you come back and you got your money back at least. That's good news, promising. Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. And, Andy, I understand you've got a big football newsletter coming out this week. Uh, yes, Mark. In addition to doing the um, uh, the Week 1 games, uh, which is a very attractive schedule this week, the newsletter will also take a look at uh, what I consider the money earners and the money burners for each of the conferences as far as the teams I look to have winning or losing point spread records. Also predicting a champion, a runner-up, and a, a dark horse candidate to uh, uh, win the uh, uh, the conference uh, championship. By the way, just following up on what Victor said, I've always maintained, again, the idea of preseason is not to win. I would say that in the vast majority of games, you could almost make these games pick them. So anytime you can get an opportunity to take points, that seems to be the way to go. Now, this year was an extreme result as far as underdog performance goes. But when you, you take a look at it, unless the coach comes out and basically says, we're going to play our entire starters the first half and into the third quarter, or they say, we're not going to play anyone this week. Again, a number of the key players did not play any in the preseason. Underdogs seem to be the way to go. And yet we've, and we've seen some significant line moves. Victor, you may even have looked at this. Significant point spread line moves, not just total, but point spread line moves that turned out to be highly inaccurate this year where teams were opening two, three-point favorites, and they were better up to four and a half, five, or six. Well, Tony Mejia, let me ask you this question. Tony Mejia, playbook expert, contributor to the sporting news. Andy mentioned about the numbers being skewed to the underdog this year. Do you foresee the start of next year's preseason starting out that way where the odds makers are going to remember what happened last year, pad the underdog, and then go from there? No, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think you take everything from week to week, from year Especially to year. Especially preseason, right. Right. Uh, and, and I think that there was a lot of reactionary stuff as to, all right, this team is playing its starters for the entire half. This team doesn't care at all. Uh, let's lay six and a half on on some numbers. The, the, the game that really stands out was the Colts, um, where it was uh, you know very clearly – set up for Indianapolis to cover that first half. They ended up covering the full game, but then could not get into the end zone with four chances right outside the five yard line. And then a pick six, which, uh, which really hurt matters. I I got burned by that game. Um, You know, then there were some other instances where uh, teams did come through uh, 
by playing guys. I, I did do well on the Bears this uh, preseason, so that was good. And I, I think uh, you could just see that from from a, a talent level, their depth was pretty good. Uh, I thought it was interesting today, just to change the subject a little bit, uh, now that waivers have uh, cleared and, and teams have made their final cuts and then graded other rosters. Uh, I, I saw that the Panthers and Patriots made the most pickups and Seattle's defense, uh, two of their defensive cuts ended up on Carolina, uh, which I thought was interesting. Michigan uh, running back uh, Hawkins from last year, he got cut and uh, Jim Harbaugh scooped him up. Surprise. So, <laughs> right. John Hawkins. So I, I, I thought that was, that was pretty neat, but um, yeah, I mean, you, you see that, uh, you know, teams that went against these, uh, these uh, one another in the preseason and, and joint scrimmages and whatnot obviously had guys that uh, they had circled and said hey if, if they get cut uh, let's let's make a bid on, in on them so thought uh, that that was uh, a neat a uh, after effect of the preseason but for me it was uh, I think I finished one game over 500 and certainly I started hotter than I ended and uh, I finished up maybe two unit stops so good. up is good. I mean, yeah, not quite, a, not quite a wash. So better up than down. Up is always good. Jim Feist is not with us this week, guys. He'll be joining us next week when we delve into the National Football League in the first full week of the NFL football card here on Mark Lawrence Against the Spread. Greg De Palma, our producer, and Greg, I got to ask you this question before we get into our football show. I missed the Travers this week, and I have no idea who won. And I'm sure if you were on, I know you do your show with John Hardoon and Chad Summers. Uh, if there was any mid-range priced horse in that race, I'm sure you were all over it. But what happened in the Travers that I was not aware of? Well, Fierceness actually won. So he's won now two. As expected. Won two big races in a row for the first time. Because uh, right. that, that's, again, that's an interesting thing about horse racing as well. Just like in sports, uh, that's a horse that has always had one good race one bad race, one good, one bad. Never had two good in a row. So uh, what do you do in football? Just like uh, if handicapping, well, you don't bet him because he's never produced back-to-back -back good races, but he did it for the first time. Short price, though, so that's why it wasn't worth gambling on such a, a number. The horse that finished second uh, was actually a female. She was going oh, up Philly. against the boys. Philly, yep. Wow. She was going up against the boys and finished second. And Sierra Leone, the bridesmaid, of uh, this uh, this year, just finishing second and third, and all these big races once again finished in third. So uh, yeah, but the uh, of course the big uh, races are coming up in the Breeders' Cup in November. So we still have a little bit ways to go before uh, November hits, and then of course the Breeders' Cup. The two days are just a fantastic couple of days that uh, we all get excited about. Sierra Leone, a, a, a maid, as you say, brides me, but boy, she's got a chunk of money in her bank account. You know. If she, well, that's she true. As she hits the board, or he hits the board all the time, and I'm glad to see the filly did well. I know there was a lot of people, and there's a lot of uh, horse racing purists that uh, would automatically throw her out because she was in a big race against the boys. But uh, I have a good friend of mine, John Pritchie, who uh, has been in the horse racing business a long, long time. In fact, he went from Florida to up to Saratoga for the Travers, and uh, uh, he said the same thing about throwing the filly out. He said, but this one's really hard to throw out because she looks like she's the real deal. What kind of a race did she run, Greg? Uh, well, uh, she was kind of stalking most of the race, uh, so she and but she just couldn't uh, catch Fierceness late. It was really a two-horse race down at the end between those two, but Fierceness uh, just held her off, and uh, he was just too good to beat. And is. Nothing you can do on one of those days, but it was you know a really good race because Doorknock, of course, was one of the favorites, and Doorknock had won those last two big races, uh, including uh, what did he win? The Belmont, I believe. Um, uh, yes. So he got the Triple Crown race. He had that next really big Grade One win, and then uh, just couldn't get it done here. So he really wasn't a factor, Doorknock. Well, tip of the hat to Fierceness uh, on a job well done in the Preakness, to say the least, for sure. I'm sure we'll likely see him in the Breeders' Cup, uh, in the big race in the Breeders' Cup. Let's move over to what we're here for, guys, a football card. And that would be this week. We're going to tear down our college football predictions for the year and our college football preview. And let's start it off, if we may. I'm going to go around the board with the panel here about the, the college football 
teams uh, to, that will make the semifinals and the championship games this year. Uh, if, and I'll start it all off here, if I may, with Tony Mejia. We'll go right back to Tony. And Tony, who do you have making it to both the college football finals and the championship game? I mean, I've got Oregon and uh, and uh, Georgia being my finalists. I think those are the top two teams going into the season. Uh, it's certainly going to be interesting for Oregon to navigate being in the Big Ten, but they do have Ohio State, I believe, going into Eugene early. So. That should give them a leg up if they handle business at home. Uh, and then uh, I, I see that Ohio State and Michigan will play their customary final game of the season. So I think that'll be an elimination game as to who makes the uh, conference final. Uh, and so we'll, you know, we'll see what happens in terms of how that lays out for all these teams. Big 10, Big 12, I see is wide open. Uh, SEC gets Oklahoma and Texas then. I think Texas will rise to the occasion and I see Oklahoma dipping. Uh, but uh, and uh, where we have the ACC now, that's seemingly wide open with Georgia Tech handling Georgia State uh, conference loss right out of the gate. So my surprise team in that uh, conference is Virginia Tech, and if they can avoid more than two losses, I think they'll end up being uh, a surprise uh, conference football playoff squad. We'll set the card up for our listeners out there, and not only preview the teams we think that will make. It. Uh, the final four of this year's football playoff, but also the teams that we would perhaps be betting as value bets uh, to possibly make the final four as well on the show here today. With that, Victor King, how do you see, Victor, this championship final four pairing out this year? Well, I've got got them broken down into who I think the eight teams will be in the quarterfinals and then the semifinals. Uh, A lot of my selections are in total agreement with what Tony just told you, that is for sure. But the uh, quarterfinals, I do have Ohio State as the number one, defeating number nine, Alabama. Number two at that point, we see Georgia taking on Ole Miss in a all SEC uh, quarterfinal, Georgia defeating the uh, Rebs. The third quarterfinal, I've got number 11, Texas, also another SEC team, taking on who I think is going to be a surprise team out of the Big 12 Conference, and that's the Arizona Wildcats. And we do see uh, the Longhorns taking care of the Wildcats. And finally, uh, the fourth quarterfinal matchup, we have Oregon as the number five seed taking on a, again, like Tony said, surprising Virginia Tech Hokie team, the number four seed. For the semifinals, we've got Ohio State defeating Oregon, and then what looks like it could be a potential Big Ten matchup in the semis, and then Georgia against Texas, and then we've got Georgia taking down the Buckeyes in the finals. Of course, Carson Beck uh, returns. Kirby Smart is loaded. Beck had a debut season last year that was uh, a a very good season. No, they didn't get the three-peat, but I think that they're hungry enough to go all the way again this season. Well, Victor's got Ohio State, Georgia making it to the final championship game this year. Andy Isco, how do you see this year's 12-team college football playoff race shaking out? And we'll probably have to remind Andy to turn his mute off. No, I, I just had the uh, wrong screen up there when I you were talking. It. I was looking for no something. Problem. But I have it a little bit different because I think that the playoff, I think we're going to see some of the 5 through 12 seeds uh, pull upsets when they get into that uh, uh, second round. So I'm going to go a little bit off the grid this year to a certain extent. Uh, the top four seeds I have as being, um, um, well, the four, four teams coming out of the conference, Alabama, Utah, Oregon, and Clemson. I think we're going to make it to the uh, final four. I think Georgia is going to get eliminated at some point, even if they are a number one or number two seed. Uh, I then have um, uh, Alabama getting by Oregon and Clemson getting by Utah. And I'm going with Alabama to defeat Clemson, a year that we don't know what to expect Alabama other than they return a great number of key players, of NFL players from last year. Yeah, the new coach who's had success elsewhere, DeVore. And uh, again, a very highly rated. In fact, I think they were the number two recruiting class behind uh, Georgia. And I look for a rebound season from Clemson, who I think failed to win double-digit games for the first time in a decade or so. Uh, 
Uh, Sweeney is uh, very focused on this year's team. I think the ACC will be a very balanced and competitive conference this year as opposed to what it's been in recent years. I think some of the teams that a lot of people may have expectations in that conference for teams like uh, uh, Miami, I think may be a little bit of, uh, of an underachiever this year. Uh, don't know what to expect out of uh, Florida State. I do like, for example, Boston College, and I think Pitt makes a rebound. And uh, Tony does mention the Virginia Tech team that I think – Maybe it won't be very long, but they're still a little bit under the radar. But I have Clemson coming out and uh, losing to Alabama in the championship game. Andy sprinkling a few teams in the mix here when we're talking about making the Final Four. Greg De Palma, I know, I know who you'll be on when we talk about future bets getting to the Final Four for some value. But how do you realistically see the semifinals in the championship game setting up? Well, we did our uh, – preview on the Arlads uh, football network last yes. week so uh luckily we got a jump start uh so uh if anyone wants to check that out obviously they can i'll put a link in the description for that but uh as far as what we talked about last week uh it, it really wasn't unfortunately uh exciting as far as you know going with any of these big long shots or anything like that um but overall uh i had Georgia beating Texas A&M in the SEC. I had Ohio State over Oregon in the Big Ten. North Carolina State, that was one of my little sleepers. They're not like a major shock, but because I think they're about 6-1 to one to win the conference title over Miami in the ACC. And Utah over Iowa State in the Big 12 championship game. So those are my four conference uh, championship teams. And, uh, and yeah, so when it really came down to it, as far as just who I think are, are, will be there in the end, I mean, I think it is going to be kind of hard for me to not put Georgia and Ohio State in there and be boring about it. Um, and, and so I just think it's going to be real tough. Georgia, Ohio State, championship game. I probably favor Ohio State, though. Not necessarily say that they're going to be the favorite in the game. But I really like this Howard kid out of Kansas State. And I think maybe this is uh, something that's going to help Ohio State. They're so used to the C.J. Stroud types, you know, those big NFL prospect quarterbacks. Howard is not that, but I think what he is is he's a gutsy, winning college football quarterback that I think is just going to be a perfect fit for Ohio State. And they've got that backfield now of Henderson and Judkins, which is something that they have not had in a long time. So I think they're going to see a lot of running this year. They also have a superstar, five-star recruit at wide receiver. Big surprise, top recruit in the country. Uh, so I just think Ohio State, with uh, especially with Jim Harbaugh out of the way, I think maybe this is their year. By the way, I think the addition of Chip Kelly uh, with uh, Ryan Day there you go. Uh, could make a huge difference for Ohio mm -hmm. State as far as the offense goes. Because Chip Kelly, okay, he had some success as a head coach, but he, he made his career uh, out of his offensive creativity. Which should benefit Ohio State for sure this year. I'm going to shake it up a little bit with my semifinal and championship game picks. Uh, just from the standpoint of refusing to beat Chalk Chalk, that's all. Uh, Ohio State and Georgia look to be the obvious two teams to make it to the championship game. Uh, but I'm going to shake up with a little different team here. I think Florida or Georgia is the team that wins this whole thing. But uh, I'm going to put Alabama in the semifinals here in amongst the crowd, the, uh, the other good crowd, the Ohio States and uh, other teams. But what I like about the Alabama football team this year is – Kalen DeBoer, their head coach. I mean, the guy is just nothing but a winner. It's all he's ever known. He's inheriting all of Nick Saban's recruits. That's a real, real nice cupboard that he inherited. And if it ends up being Alabama and Georgia, one thought you might want to remember if these two teams do meet, I think a replay of the SEC championship game last year. The one stat you might want to remember is that Georgia has won 45 games in a row against any school other than Alabama. So if anybody wants to get in Georgia's way, good luck with that. If it's Alabama, it could be a case we could have a good showdown game. So taking a look at it that way, that's kind of how I'm going to look at uh, Alabama to make a little bit of an upset and make a message here. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. And we've got our playbook football newsletter out for week number one in the college football world. Every college football game is analyzed written and, and analyzed with full analysis inside the newsletter this week. Jam Pack, you can download it now at playbooksports.com just in time for the weekend. And also, I would like to remind our listeners out there, 
to hit the like button if you like the show and more importantly hit the subscribe button it doesn't cost you anything at all to subscribe we can keep you in touch with what it is that we're doing here on the podcast and when you do both like and subscribe to the site we'll be sending you a free copy of the playbook football preview guide magazine the pdf version so real nice bonus simply by hitting the like and the subscribe buttons down below if you will with that guys let's turn it over now to something a little bit more exotic in a sense if you will the championship futures and you know we could talk about how we're betting the teams that we just said that we like to make it to the finals and the semifinals. but uh i'm a little bit more interested in what you're looking at for a value bet to make it to the college football championship and semifinal rounds and with that let's talk about value with victor king and Victor, what do you see for value for futures as far as the championship futures are concerned? Well, I, I may have got the question wrong, but the research I did was conference championship futures. So l- let me just run through these real quick from the ACC conference. We do know that NC State, uh, the Wolfpack, uh, cleaned up in the portal. They added, uh, what, quarterback race in the call. Uh, this That's could be the most potent offense uh, since the 2014 season for NC State, they got a nice accommodating schedule. That sets up nicely for them as well. Of course, the problem there is that uh, this is a program that has not won 10 games. Uh, I think it's only happened once in their history. What we I do like NC State at the current plus 600 odds. Not to mention the team that we talked about just now uh, a few minutes ago, Virginia Tech at plus 1,100 in the ACC. Uh, if you're looking for a long shot in the Big Ten, yeah, it could very well be Ohio State. I mean, uh, and Oregon, they're the favorites. They're the chalk. But uh, I may throw a couple dollars at a Wisconsin team that's currently around, what, 65 to 1. I believe they're plus 6500. Now, they hired Luke Fickle to get him over the hump. Uh, and he's going to need that uh, air raid offense which in the Big Ten still generates a little bit of skepticism, that's for sure. What do they have, a 7-6 and six season last year? They got a favorable road slate in 2024, the Badgers too. No Ohio State, no Michigan on the schedule. You got to like their odds, 65-1. to one. Uh, Big 12, look for maybe, with a big transfer quarterback, K.J. Jefferson, Central Florida. Uh, I'm showing somewhere around 9-1 to one odds for our boys down here in the Sunshine State. Of course, K.J. Jefferson played for Arkansas. Gus Malzahn has anointed him as the closest prototype to Cam Newton that there is in college football. You want to talk about pressure? That's for sure. But uh, I do like the addition for Central Florida. They could have some big odds in what should be a wide-open Big 12 conference. Uh, Finally, if you're looking for a long shot in the SEC, uh, consider Missouri. Uh, I know, I believe Andy played their team total over last week. I did the same thing. You got to love their schedule at, uh, what, plus 2,000. That's 20 to 1 odds. They're off that breakthrough season. Everybody loves Elia Drinkwitz at the head coach. They went 11-2. and two. They even beat Ohio State in the bowl game, for God's sake. Uh, they got Brady Cook returning. He's their quarterback. They got a very good receiver returning as well. Uh, yeah, they play road games, Alabama and A&M, but their home contests are pretty good, and they will not face Georgia or Texas or LSU or Tennessee or Old Miss during the regular season. So just a few uh, conference championship long shots to consider and for maybe for you guys to comment on as well. Victor King, publisher of the Totals Tip Sheet, absolutely a must-have this football season if you like nfl football totals you're going to love the totals tip sheet i encourage everybody to go online at playbooksports.com sign up now for the totals tip sheet he's had an outstanding record in the total tip sheet i know it's only been like one or two losing seasons am i correct victor with that right we're heading into our 18th year now with only two losing seasons so we are uh looking forward to another Good season coming up, and we've just started doing a lot of the research here during this week. That's a total tip sheet, guys. Download it online at playbooksports.com. Best move you'll be making this week. With that, Tony Mejia, how do you see the value as far as these college football futures are concerned with the college football playoffs? 
Well, value-wise, I, I think the Big 12 is the way to go just because it's so wide open. I'll say, I'll say to Victor, I appreciate the, the UCF love, but we, we at UCF say, don't call it Central Florida anymore, too directional. They've been saying that since I was in school in the late 90s. So <laughs> it, it took a while. Uh, and, and still, I mean, you, you get your scent flaws, but uh, now, now we're pretty much universally uh, known as UCF, which is good. Is a directional school thing is a stigma for all these little guys. Um, and look, I, I think that, that KJ Jefferson wasn't my favorite quarterback uh, at Arkansas. You know, he oozes talent, but definitely makes some mistakes with with his uh, calls at the line, checking into stuff that that doesn't yield results. And when he is inaccurate, it it doesn't seem to uh, have a quick fix. So he's he's definitely a guy who needs to get into a groove, needs to get protection, needs to get hit too. Uh, sometimes that wakes him up. And so hopefully uh, a, a, a change in, in scenery and uh, Gus Malzahn and an offense that should be dynamic and should be run heavy um, will really bring out the best in KJ Jefferson. RJ Harvey is legit um, and, and so is Penny Boone, uh, reigning Mac Offensive Player of the Year comes over and so they've got a two-headed running back plus Jefferson plus some receivers so certainly excited about UCF but again the the Big 12 is loaded with potential surprise teams I really like Oklahoma State uh, you know on, on Greg Zarlat's poll they were the team that I picked to move into the top 12 dropping Florida State out uh, I like uh, Alan Bowman he's been around forever started as a true freshman at Texas Tech. This is like his eighth year, would it be, Tony? Yeah, like eight million. I, I, I don't know offhand exactly what year he is, but he's been around forever yes, yeah. uh, and playing a lot of, of, of uh, college football. And then he spent a year basically as an apprentice at Michigan. So I'm sure he picked up a lot. Uh, and so he's going to be a, a essential for Oklahoma State uh, because they do have so much talent around him. Uh, and uh, we'll see if they are able to uh, – to make things happen there. I, I do agree that Utah is a team to beat, but I can get behind Kansas State. Um, you know, Early on, they get Arizona and Oklahoma State coming into Manhattan, which I think is, is huge early on. And then we'll see what happens late. Uh, and certainly Chris Kleiman has is, is proven that he can be a giant slayer and is a heck of a coach. But for our purposes of what team um, to make the playoffs, that I, I think odds-wise is very interesting. Again, it, it's just to make the playoffs, not to win the national championship, not to reach the semifinals, just to make the playoffs. Arizona at plus 750, I think that's pretty good. Uh, coaches will not to, uh, players will not tune Brent Brennan out. Uh, got results at San Jose State. He's a player's coach. He comes in and inherits a heck of a quarterback and arguably the top wide receiver in the country uh, in uh, Teotori Tia, McMillan. So you got McMillan, you got Lafita, is it Lafita? Uh, Fifida. Uh, Noah Fifida, it, you know, somebody that put up huge numbers last year. And then Arizona, they have that game at Kansas State. If they win that game, um, they're set up really pretty uh, to have a week off. And then uh, basically you're, you're got a free roll in Salt Lake City. If you beat Kansas State, nobody expects you to win that game. And then if, if you beat Utah, man, the hype machine, uh, would be off the, off the rails. Uh, but what I really like about Arizona and making the playoff is that they close out with a very manageable schedule in November. You got at UCF in Orlando. Obviously, I'll be rooting for UCF, but it wouldn't surprise me if Arizona wins that game. And then you close with a home game against Houston. Obviously, be favored in that one. Then you play at TCU. Uh, we'll see what TCU does this weekend against Stanford. It's actually Friday night. Uh, to see if they can bounce back uh, from you know, falling off a cliff last season after making the national uh, championship game the year prior. Uh, and then you close in your Centennial Cup game against Arizona State. So that's a winnable November. That's a four for four November if you're where you need to be, if, we're, if Brennan has everybody healthy and locked in. And that alone gets you into the Big 12 championship game and gets you into the college football playoff. Thoughts from me? Tony Mejia with a lot of possibilities working there for this year's college football playoffs. We'll see exactly how all those shake out. Andy Isco, what sort of value do you see with these college football teams as far as making the playoffs and maybe even making it to the semifinals in the championship game? 
Okay, Mark. First, I want to uh, just uh, correct Victor a little bit. It was Ole Miss last week that I played over the total, not Missouri. I'm actually oh, okay. looking at, at Missouri as a team because of all the hype and the, and the strength of the conference overall. I'm looking to uh, bet against Missouri in games this year because I thought, although I think they'll have a successful season, they may be a little bit overvalued based upon a lot of the hype. And, of course, the coach does deserve the respect he had. A&M is another team that I think I mentioned last year. I'm uh, looking at the uh, ACC. Uh, from what I said before, I do like Clemson to win. I like uh, Virginia Tech as the uh, runner-up in that conference. Uh, but as far as Pittsburgh with the Narduzzi uh, somewhat uh, under the, uh, the pressure for the hot seat, they were 3-9 and nine last year after some successful seasons. Uh, now, I don't know what the current odds are, but I saw earlier the 100 to 1 to win that conference, and I expect them they return a fair amount of, uh, of talent. So it's worth a little bit of a play at, at those kind of odds, what I expect to be, as I mentioned before, a better overall um, uh, Miami and Florida State as far as being able to be as successful as a lot of people think. Looking at the Big Ten, well, it comes down to Oregon and Ohio State as far as uh, finishing 1-2. I've got Oregon winning uh, that uh, uh, that title, but not a great deal of value there. Uh, a team that I've liked, and I was a little bit early last year, but not totally surprised. I like what Matt Rule uh, has over at the Nebraska, and I think that uh, they are at some very attractive odds. I saw them about a month ago at somewhere around 40 or 50-1 to 1, uh, to win the uh, uh, to win the Big Ten Championship. Of course, it makes sense with Oregon, Ohio State. You can throw Penn State in there as well, and Wisconsin to a certain extent. Oh, Wisconsin may also be uh, a nice uh, uh, future at about 50 or 60-1 to 1 to win the conference because all the money is coming in on Oregon and uh, Ohio State. Big 12, I, I, think, I have to think that Utah is the best team. Uh, looking at their physical play, which a lot of Big 12 teams are not that uh, uh, accustomed to, I think will present a challenge, especially for teams that have to visit uh, Utah. I have Kansas State finishing second to Utah, at least second in the uh, championship game. And I've, I'm going off the grid again for a long shot because they have a strong history. They struggled in their first year uh, in the uh, Big 12 Conference, and that's Cincinnati. Bring back a lot of talent. They know how to win, and I think they'll have some winnable games against some of the teams that may be a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, uh, have, have more expected of them this year. Uh, Arizona is a team I'm, look, I'm going to look to play on during the season in games. Kansas State, I like what Kleiman has done there, and I think that this might be the year, especially. And what, may, and, and <coughs> up, what makes this a very good year for some uh, new teams in the Big 12 is Oklahoma and Texas are gone. So, you know, the favorites, Kansas, Kansas State, Utah, wouldn't be surprised if some other team sneaks in there and at least makes it to the uh, championship game. Finally, uh, in the uh, in the SEC, I mentioned earlier, I like Alabama. Don't think there's value in playing them, although this year, you know, because of the depth of the conference, I've seen Alabama somewhere around six or seven to one just to win the uh, SEC because you've got Georgia, obviously, which is almost even money, maybe even a little bit minus 110, minus 120. You got Texas, you got Ole Miss, which is very high. I have Alabama beating Ole Miss for the uh, uh, championship. Tennessee, and then my long shot in the conference, which is right around 18 or 20 to one. And I think Greg mentioned this team, Texas A&M. I expect a very good year uh, out of that team, Elko. Uh, returning to uh, where he was defensive coordinator and I mentioned you know the success he had and Duke highly thought of and uh, A&M brings back the talent you know what tells me about Texas A&M I think and, and I think Mark in the playbook it showed last year A&M had 10 returning starters on offense 10 returning starters on defense right. and they struggled what does that tell you it tells you pretty much Fisher really good recruiter not so much a good game coach I think it's a huge upgrade in that, that ability and also Elko a good recruiter as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if Texas A&M, I think their odds are about 20 to 1 to win the uh, SEC. And I think you can still get 40 or 50 to 1 on them to win the overall championship if you want to spoil the, uh, uh, the final four party. Andy Isco with his review of what he's looking at for the college football playoffs this year. And Andy, let me throw this note out there. I'm just glancing quickly at our Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. You mentioned A&M had 10 re returning starters on both sides of the football last year. And they're bringing back a boatload of starters once again this year. This is a team that's really two years in a row really kind of rather well fortified. Greg De Palma, I know I'm going to hear. There's one name I know I'm going to hear on your list here, but uh, I'd like to hear your other teams that you're looking at as far as making the college football playoffs are concerned this year from a value standpoint. 
Yeah, we gave our futures uh, last week, so here they are. Um, in the SEC, and, and my futures are all going to be for the national championship. Uh, so um, I'm going to move those over here so people can see them on the board. And uh, here they are. Okay, so um, I'm going to go with a couple of teams from the SEC to start off with. Uh, and that would be Ole Miss at 14-1 to and Texas A&M at... Uh, 40 to 1, which is what they were last week. Now they've, uh, let's see if they've dropped much here. Let's see. Uh, no, they're still 40 to 1. No, yeah, yeah. And Ole Miss is 14. So those are the ones there that are my SEC picks. Um, ACC, I'm going to go ahead, and since I have Miami winning the ACC cha- or getting to the ACC championship game, I'm going to go ahead and put them uh, in the list at 40 to 1. Uh, uh, they were 50 to 1 last week, so now they're down to 40 to 1. I also had Utah at 55 to 1. They're still 55 to 1. And my other ACC title game member is my biggest long shot of all. Uh, it's North Carolina State at 130 to 1. Nice. Big round numbers from Greg DePalm, who loves those attractive, big looking, juicy dogs. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, I'm going to say this. He only needs to cash one of those tickets to have a wonderful season. (laughs) Yeah. That's that's exactly what it is all about, Andy. Just cash one of those tickets and you're not hurting. I'm greedy. I'll root for him to cash two. Yeah, he cashes two and all of a sudden he's in the driver's seat. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to break these down these four ways within the four major conferences, guys. I'm taking a look at, from a value standpoint, about the teams to make the playoffs here. Big 12, which I think is absolutely loaded. I think the Big 12 has as much talent as any of the other Power Four conferences, if wow. not more. You can go down six, seven, eight teams deep into this conference, and if any one of those six, seven, or eight teams uh, makes it to the college football playoff, nobody's going to be surprised. I mean, I'm leaving home the Kansases and the Kansas States and the Cincinnati's and Luke Fickle, uh, those football teams that have a lot of promise, uh, as also we talked about earlier with Tony Mejia in this conference here, but a guy I'm going to, I cannot leave home is Iowa State. They're number one in the country in returning overall production rankings, and uh, I keep beating on this, and the reason I keep beating on it is because all you need to do is go back and look at the top three teams in returning production rankings last year, and you just literally cleaned up. Number one team in the country this year, Iowa State. They have to be on your ticket. And the number two team, as far as value is concerned, is Oklahoma State. Also, a lot of returning starters in this football team, and they're priced right in there just about where Iowa State is. So either one of these two teams makes it to the playoffs out of the Big 12 Conference, it's a nice ticket you're going to cash. Inside the Big 10 Conference, uh, I believe it was – who, who was it, Victor, you had Iowa and Wisconsin? You mentioned them? Yeah, Wisconsin, right. You mentioned Iowa, Victor? That was me. I did not. That no. was me last week. I have Iowa okay. – actually, I have Iowa as 12th in my poll. Okay, well, I'm going to pick one of each. I'm going to take uh, Victor's Wisconsin and Greg's Iowa. (laughs) And, uh, you know, Iowa is a football team. You see, my God, I mean, last year, dead last, horribly last in offense last year. They were just absolutely pathetic. But they made a lot of changes and a lot of adjustments. They got a lot of returning talent coming back here. And the fact of the matter is, you tell me the last time Iowa didn't make a college bowl game. It's been, like, forever. And if they make a bowl game, why not make it to the college football playoff? There's a nice price to Iowa and Wisconsin for all the same reasons with Luke Fickle. I mean, not Luke Fickle. This Wisconsin football team that made all these nice changes and always in the running in the Big Ten Conference. It doesn't matter when they had divisions or whether they didn't have divisions. Wisconsin is a very well-schooled football program. In the ACC, I have to put Clemson on top. I've talked before about Dabo Swinney, and I think this is his comeback year. Uh, he's won so many times in the college football playoffs. I read somewhere where somebody wrote that uh, uh, you saw Clemson in the college football playoffs more often than you saw Kirk Herbstreet uh, and Chris Fowler doing playoff games together. That's how automatic Clemson has been in the college football playoffs. And right behind them, I've got Louisville, who I think is a team packed with value, a ton of returning starters in this football program here. And I'm all about the head coach there as well. I just love the job that he does. Finally, the Southeast Conference, Texas A&M. That's a big, big price for a football team. I think can make a lot of noise, uh, and I agree with that. And the other guy, I can't leave at home, and I know they may not be as big of a price as these others that I just mentioned here, but Mississippi is going to make a big run this football season here. They are really deeply talented and deeply loaded here, and don't be surprised if Ole Miss is not playing in 
the Southeast Conference Championship game this year. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg De Palma, our producer from Prime Sports Network. And Greg, if you will, if you could do our honors here, and let's talk a little bit about the, uh, if you will, the, the Heisman Trophy and all of the, the, the value and who's involved in the Heisman Trophy this year. All right, let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, because to tell you the truth, the Heisman Trophy uh, is every couple of years you get you, you can get a, a good number. Um, what you got to do is is you got to get it quick though. You got to like zero in on a player that might have a really good first week, and then because then you, you lose your odds. Because I've seen players at like fifty to one, sixty to one have that really great week one, and they're like six to one the next week. Everybody, because they don't know. I mean, a lot of people don't know. Uh, so they have to see him just at one time to convince them that, wait a second, this guy has a shot. So uh, taking a look at here at the odds, we've got Gabriel as the favorite, which uh, is I think is a good I think is good good news if anybody's betting Eisman because I can't imagine that um, I would want to put six money on a six to one shot like Dylan Gabriel. He's a good quarterback. They're a good school, but I think that's asking a lot. For Dylan Gabriel, there's Carson Beck, pretty much his co-favorite. So uh, let's go around the horn. And of course, I'll, I'll scroll down here as we do this. So we'll start with uh, Tony. What do you want to take a look at? And uh, who have you been looking at as far as maybe some good choices, uh, maybe even your overall choice, if you only had to bet one Heisman winner? Oh, well, let me load up this, uh, this screen right here, which is kind of... Uh... Come back to me next, because I don't know okay. why, but my uh, my screen is Victor circling. Sure, I can definitely contribute there. Now, there's some good names out there, that's for sure. Down here in South Florida, we are really looking forward to what Cam Ward can do uh, this season. The uh, transfer from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, also, one of my favorite quarterback names would be uh, Jackson Dart, the gunslinger from Mississippi. But if you're asking me who is the best quarterback long shot at maybe 12 to 1 odds or higher, you don't got to scroll down that far for me, Greg. And Mark touched on this a little bit. Give me Jalen Millworld, that quarterback from Alabama. Yep. Currently about, what, uh, 14 to 1 odds. Now, we, we know what he did last year, and he's got an axe to grind as well. He made himself a Heisman Trophy candidate. At the end of last season, with his play down the stretch from November and December, he posted a 10 to 1 TD to interception ratio. He rushed for over 300 yards with over seven rushing touchdowns. He's a dual threat quarterback. He can do it both ways. Um, he rushed for 100 plus yards twice in November. Big signature wins against Tennessee against LSU, against Georgia. He could have made the jump to the NFL if he wanted to, or even transferred to another college football title contender. Instead, he decided to stay in Tuscaloosa, even after they uh, lost Nick Saban, when he found that the quarterback whisperer is making the move to Tuscaloosa, Mark Bench and Kalen DeBoer. So uh, I see him trying to get the bitter taste out of his mouth that was left by his very final play of last season's game against the Michigan Wolverines. And I like the value at Jalen Milrow, currently at 14 to one odds. Nice. All right. That's a great way to start off with. As you can see, the odds are pretty solid for a Heisman winner, especially the caliber of Jalen Milrow. Okay, Andy, who do you like? Well, I'm going to go to a team that uh, Mark mentioned a little earlier, and that's Ole Miss. By the way, a, a plug for the uh, Playbook Preview magazine because th you'll find this very interesting. We all know about Lane Kiffin and his great offense. Take a look at the defensive improvement that Lane Kiffin has made at Ole Miss. His uh, 2020 season, the COVID season, they allowed 521 per game. Then it's down to 420, 388, and 365. And a lot of that has to do with their ability to stop the run. 5.4 yards per rush they allowed, then 4.5, 4.2, 4.0. With that kind of defense, and I expect it to uh, continue this year with nine starters, I think the offense is going to be extremely prolific. And I like Jackson Dart, the quarterback, to have a big season uh, for Ole Miss and put up some very good numbers. If he makes mistakes, uh, the defense will probably be able to bail him out, but I don't think he's going to make that many mistakes. Uh, he's actually drawn some money. I think he opened around 20, 22 to 1. He's down over at the uh, Westgate right now here in Vegas at 14 to 1, and I think that's reasonable 
uh, for a guy who probably won't get a lot of attention, at least not early in the season until we get into conference play. If you want a long shot and you believe in Deion Sanders, then uh, his quarterback, uh, Shador Sanders, 40 to 1. They should put up some big numbers in the Big 12. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, that's why he's 40 to 1. There's a lot of really good quarterbacks out there. Um, it'd be hard not to see a quarterback winning because it's a, a loaded field. I think Cam Ward of, uh, of Miami has an excellent chance. I'm going to go with Jackson Dart because I think Mississippi's going to have an outstanding season. I mentioned I played him over nine and a half wins. Got a very favorable schedule. And if they can get to 10, 11 wins, uh, that'll get them in the playoffs. And if they're in the playoffs, even though the Heisman voting comes before, but if they've already gotten into the playoffs when the Heisman voting comes in, I think uh, uh, we'll see uh, Jackson Dart's name in the top three. Okay, Tony, are you ready? I am ready. I don't. I, I'm. I'm not messing with my uh, with my screen because every time I do, it, it kind of shorts out. So if you would, you can leave Riley Leonard right there. That helps me out. Actually, move it up past on Sanders. But I have that on my screen. So Cam Rising and below. But uh, and, and Cam Rising is a good place to start for long yeah. shot, long shot plus four thousand. So it, it, he's first of all, he's got the the narrative. Narrative sell. Uh, as a writer, I, and knowing who votes on this award, you know that it's 80% what you do on the field, 20% what you bring to the table uh, from a narrative. And uh, certainly Rank Rising does. He's been in, in college for quite some time as well. Comes off a season-ending injury. It was a will he or won't he situation as far as whether he'd play or not um, you know, for a lot of the beginning of last season. And then it became crystal clear that he was going to redshirt now he's back, Utah, in a new conference. If they are able to seal the deal and win the Big 12, certainly uh, that uh, four, four, uh, plus 4,000 will look like a bargain. I like Neo, Nico Ayamalieva uh, from Tennessee, and Ayamalieva is very difficult to say. So I heard it said uh, on one of these college football shows that he could be a first-name basis quarterback, and Nico certainly works. Uh, so that could certainly work in his favor. Tennessee... And they've got that very difficult game. I'm sure you'll be watching, Greg, NC State uh, in Charlotte. That's uh, one of the better games of next week. And if they are able to secure that victory, they play in Norman a couple of weeks later. I'm not high on the on the Sooners this season, uh, although I do think they'll smoke Temple on Thursday night. But that is a winnable game for Tennessee. And then they get Florida and Alabama in Knoxville on back-to-back -back weeks. I think they could win both of those games. So we could be talking about an undefeated Tennessee squad heading into November. Uh, and they play at Georgia on November 16th. Even if you lose that game and you're still in the mix to win it, to, to reach the SEC championship, I think that bodes well for Nico, who's at plus 1,200. Um, you know, some other names that I like. Uh, Devontae Smith, the last wide receiver, uh, ended a drought to win the Heisman Trophy. I think if you ask me what wide receiver wins it, I like Arizona's a ton, but I also think uh, Luther Burden of Missouri will make uh, a huge case in terms of numbers. I think he puts up the biggest numbers. Running back, we saw what Ollie Gordon did last year at Oklahoma State. He's got that momentum in him. With uh, I talked about Bowman being a veteran quarterback. I think that they will be a productive offense, and Gordon will continue to put, pile up the touchdowns. He's at plus 70. Uh, 7,500. Riley Leonard, such an interesting game right out of the gate against a guy that's going to know him as well as anybody that happens to be a defensive guru in front of 102,000 people at Kyle Field. So if Riley Leonard leads Notre Dame to a victory on the road in College Station, I think he certainly uh, would merit uh, being one of the stories of this opening weekend and, uh, and would shoot up his current number at plus 2,200. Who was your top pick? Nico Ayamalieva. Okay. Tennis. Yeah, he reminds me of uh, Richardson uh, from Florida now with the Colts. He's got that same, yeah, I mean, like, athleticism. He's a little inaccurate, but he's got a great arm, and he's really athletic. So that's going to be the we'll, question. We'll have to see what exactly he can bring into the season because we got a glimpse of him at, at the bowl game. I, believe, I think it was a Citrus Bowl. I think it was Orlando. Um, and he played a great game, but it was one of those things where they, it, there was only one team on the field. So how does he react to the grind? I mentioned they, they've got Florida and Alabama back-to-back, -back, albeit at home, but if he's able to navigate those two games, plays well, certainly he will be on, uh, the, uh, on the minds of everybody. He might, he might be the next Tua in terms of one-name quarterbacks. Absolutely. 
And uh, we'd all be thankful for that. Okay, Mark? Well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna analyze this and break this down by history, if I may, uh, because I happen to love history and uh, share with our listeners out there that uh, I was a little bit surprised to find that you go back the last 10 years since 2014, eight of the last 10 Heisman winners actually fell between 10 to one and 40 to one on the preseason betting boards. That's a pretty good number. Each of the last 10 Heisman winners were on teams that ranked in the AP preseason top 25, eight of 10. One who this year is not there is Colorado Shador Sanders, only because Colorado is not there, obviously. And nine of the last 10 Heisman winners were on a team that ranked in the top 10. The only one who wasn't was Lamar Jackson, back in his days with Louisville because the Cardinals weren't considered to be a good enough team to be a top 10 team. But uh, Jackson more or less proved that uh, he did deserve to be not only on that list, but a Heisman Trophy winner. Mark, wasn't Lamar one of those that wasn't in the top 40 to one? I remember him being like completely like out of nowhere until that first game he played. Like nobody knew who he was. I can't say that for sure, but I would have to. Uh, that's where my, my yes vote would go, only because, as I mentioned, uh, he wasn't on a team that was in the top 10. Yeah. So it wouldn't be surprising at all if he wasn't even in, in the whisper or in the mention there. Uh, you know, he ended up probably catching, obviously, everybody's eyes the year he did win the Heisman Trophy. Uh, so, you know, good to him and kudos to him. He's going on to have a, a, a great career So since then. Uh, also, so if, if you start doing this stuff by what I just mentioned in checking out boxes and eliminating things and so forth and whatnot, that would leave eight players that are on the top 10 teams at less than 40 to one this year going in. Eight players from the top, uh, from the ranked teams, top, or top 10 teams at less than 40 to one. Dylan Gabriel from Oregon at seven to one. Carson Beck, Georgia at seven and a half to one. Now, I don't, these odds I'm giving Greg may not match up with what you're showing on the DraftKings board, sure. but these are probably pretty close. Uh, Quinn, Quinn Ewers from Texas at 10 to one. Will Howard from Ohio State at 14 to one. Alabama, Jalen Milrow at 14 to one. Jackson Dart, Ole Miss, 14 to one. Riley Leonard, Notre Dame at 22 to one. And Penn State's Drew Alar at 31 to one. So those are the eight guys that by process of elimination, where they rank in the preseason, figure to have a, a, a better than usual chance of capturing uh, the Heisman Trophy this particular year. Amazingly, uh, the Heisman Trophy favorite has only won one of the last nine times, the preseason favorite. So we, with that, we can ditch Dylan Gabriel, if we may, uh, which gets us down to five of the last 10 winners were transfers from another school the previous season. With this crazy wild world of the transfer portal that we're living in now, these quarterbacks are transferring to other schools. They're also winning Heisman trophies. Half the time they've done that, five of the last 10 have done that. This year, if you take a look at the formula of a quarterback at 40 to one or less, his team ranks in the top 25 preseason, and he did not transfer in from another team. That leaves us three quarterbacks in the Heisman Trophy race to check all of these boxes. That would be Carson Beck from Georgia, Jalen Milrow from Alabama, and Drew Alar from Penn State. So of those three quarterbacks, I'm with Victor. I'm with Jalen Milrow on this list because there's a little bit more value to him than there is Carson Beck. You know, I'm not a big James Franklin fan of Penn State at all, and I think Alar might have a real good year this year. He was a five-star recruit who really underachieved last year, but the kid's got a lot of talent. But give me Jalen Milrow for my choice for Heisman Trophy this year. Two picks for Jalen Milrow. And if Jalen Milrow does win the Heisman, then you better start putting also some money on Alabama to win the national championship. There we go. There we yep. go. So correlation, correlation. Absolutely. Already did. And uh, <laughs> about a month ago. Uh, uh, the players that I am uh, looking at, if I was going to do with a, a, a favorite, I would go. Well, first of all, I do like Beck, but I'm not going to take anybody at eight to one. Uh, Ward, I like at 15 to 1. He's probably the best of the lot that I like as favorites. But um, as Marcus said, I like the long shots, and this is definitely where I'm going to go. Um, so uh, Fafita, I think, would have a much, much better chance if he was on, say, USC instead of Arizona. 
So I just can't imagine someone from Arizona winning the Heisman. Uh, but uh, he should be in the mix. Uh, and, uh, of course, you mentioned Rising is a really good option, Tony, especially because he's got that kind of, um, you know, old school Doug Flutie kind of, th- you know, aura to him where, you know, he's uh, really not huge. He's not this big prototypical quarterback. And he's just, uh, you know, one of those gutsy, everybody loves him on the team uh, quarterbacks that could be playing quarterback for a Big 12 champion. So um, I think he's an option. Um, But the ones that I'm going to go with, my top two options, um, and there shouldn't be no surprise, I'm going to go with uh, Connor Wigman uh, at 30 to 1, the quarterback at Texas A&M. And I'm also going to go with my boy, Grayson McCall, at 110 to 1 from NC State. Uh, and by the way, Judkins and Gordon, the two running backs, are 75 to 1. And I remember uh, last year, I think it was early in the season, Mark, when you liked Judkins as a Heisman yep, candidate. I did. And now he's in a much better position at Ohio State if they run the table. Uh, and uh, the only question is, is, is Henderson going to take a lot of the glory away from him? But if, if something happens to Henderson and Judkins is yeah. sitting there and he's the, he's the workhorse on Ohio State at running back, then all of a sudden you're going to be looking at 75-1 to 1, drop to like 8-1 to 1 overnight. So that might not be a bad option. You know, you know are- talking about Ohio State, Will Howard, Chip Kelly coming in, he could put up huge numbers as a 50-point favorite against Akron this week. And if you put up like six touchdowns and pass for 350 yards, which is quite possible, your name will start to be mentioned more and more each week. So it's yeah. the scheduling and the line that he's going to be playing against. And he could put any, they could put up any, anything they want. But I think Chip Kelly will have some surprises in there, and he could be a, he could be an early favorite. How that continues throughout the season, I'm not sure. But that 14 to one, I think it is, might disappear quickly. By the way, uh, I just want to quickly ask any of you guys if you have any uh, comments on, uh, as one of the questions we ask, if you have like a representative from the group of five that you uh, think is the best team to make the playoffs? I think Boise is a clear favorite for me. Right, right. Same here. Boise State. Well, that's three of yeah, us. If they, were play, if they were playing in a better conference, I, I, I like what Rich Rod did with Jacksonville State last year. I think they're going to repeat that success this year. Uh, but the strength of schedule may, uh, may not be as strong as that uh, Boise will play. Surprised me that um, Malachi Nelson didn't win that job. They went with Mattson, the – yeah, smaller and, yeah. and more of a more of a game manager, but I, I mean he has experience, I guess. And Nelson's there. Uh, Nelson will be there. They uh, they need a uh, pick me up in the middle of the season. But sure, I, I think I think it's mostly mostly laid out for them. And um, I mean Seth Hennigan in Memphis too have a shot. By the way, he I didn't see him in the list, but that's actually someone to keep an eye on is because uh, their running back might be one of the best in the country in Genty. So. Mm-hmm. He might be probably. I didn't even see him on a list. I mean, maybe he's two hundred to one or three hundred to one to win the Heisman. He's not going to because he plays for Boise. But you never know. Mark, who did you? Uh... Well, if it's not Boise, I think it would have to be Memphis. Yeah, they're the two head and shoulders best group of five teams at least entering right. the football season here. And uh, I'd be surprised if one of those two was not in the college football playoff. By the way, each week uh, we're always going to take a look ahead, of course, at, at the week's action in the NFL and college football. We'll we'll start with the NFL because uh, Jim won't be doing college football, so we'll, we'll always start with the NFL, and then we'll, Jim can hang out if he wants with us as we talk college football. But uh, since this is the last segment, Mark, I don't know if anybody out there uh, has any uh, trends that they want people to know about to keep an eye on this week. Picks. Uh, Victor, you, you're 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 the one that uh, seems like you'd like to take a uh, go at it to begin with. A couple of things that I looked at, uh, which are unique to this week, is number one the fact that you got some of these teams who are playing their first game of the season against a team who just played last week or is playing their second game of the season, and. Uh, you would think the team that has the one game experience would under their be belt the, yep. would be the correct play. No, but not no. so fast, my friend. No. Uh, from the database, now this is only FBS schools playing each other from the database. But when you got a game one team playing a game two opponent in the last ten years, the game one team has gone forty-four and twenty-three against the spread. That's 65%. They went 4-1 and one ATS last season, 80%. There are five of them going this week. 
Home teams do even better at 24 and 9, 73 uh, percent. I'm not saying to necessarily bet all five of these game one teams, but let's at least stay away from betting on against the game it. two teams. Yeah, against well, it, right? Victor, what, what was that record again for the, uh, the last 10 years? Uh, 44 and 23 against the spread. Okay, FPS that's games, game one against the game two that, opponent. That, that's that's 67 teams who have game film on their opponent from that week one game. Right, they've got the film. But anyway, the five teams this week, the home teams are Troy home against Nevada, Arizona home against New Mexico, the three road teams, Georgia State against Georgia Tech, UCLA on the road against Hawaii, finally Boston College on the road against Florida State. Again, home teams do slightly better. But again, it tells us that that game film, that one game experience, actually doesn't mean anything when it comes to what has really occurred in the database. Love it. Really good stuff, Victor. Real good stuff. Andy, do you have anything? No, I, I was just going to say that along those lines, Victor, the teams, let's say Florida State last week, they had all summer to prepare for that first game against Georgia Tech. Meanwhile, Boston College has had all summer to prepare for Florida State. Florida State. So, so, yeah, so they've had more time to prepare for their upcoming opponent than the team that they're facing who was preparing all summer for the previous uh, opponent. Right, a uh, team that's got to travel an additional 4,000 miles from one week to the next, too. Now, I know they play, uh, is that a Sunday or Monday game, Florida State-Boston College? That's uh, the Monday, Monday yeah. Monday Either night. way, there's some travel fatigue for the Seminoles. Yeah, one I, more, I, one I more time, Victor. I want to keep an eye on that one. I want to keep an eye on that one because the game against Boston College will tell us a lot about Florida State, I think, for the rest of the year. I like this Boston College team with, with Absolutely Bill O'Brien. Absolutely will, yeah. I'm going to stay. Now, I, the one that I do like is the Georgia State uh, getting the points against uh, Georgia, Georgia Tech. Tech. Again, yeah. Georgia Tech's making that big trip. that are uh, pretty full of themselves. It was a conference game that they won, so their first place in the ACC after the first week of the season. And that's a big number to be to – be, uh, laying to an in-state rival who probably has a lot of the players that couldn't make it into Georgia Tech. And so being the ultimate, the ultimate flat spot for, for the uh, rambling wreck, the yeah. ultimate flat spot, yep. Yeah, yeah the, so I like that. The, uh, the other two ones that, I, that I've got on, and I got on a good numbers, I see Jacksonville State's now down to two and a half against the Coastal Carolina program that I think has shown slight signs of decline over their success of a few years ago. And then we talked about Texas A&M. That's one of my favorite teams. I know Greg likes them a lot as well. I actually found a two and a half last night. It's back up to three. So I wouldn't imagine, I wouldn't be surprised. I would imagine that we may see that flip back and forth. I think A&M closes as a three point favorite. I respect a lot about Notre Dame, but again, I have the highest regard for Mike Elko and the A&M program that as Mark pointed out also, as I mentioned, underperformed last year with all that returning talent and a lot of that talent returns. I like Notre Dame this year, just don't like him in this game. By the way, if Notre Dame beats Texas A&M, uh, it's going to be hard for them to lose a game this year because they have such an easy schedule. So uh, that's that's a team that really needs this game. And if they get it, they got a great, even if they lose one game after beating Texas A&M the rest of the season, it's going to be hard to keep Notre Dame out of the playoffs with just one loss. Well, not, hey, Tony, not only Tony. that, I was going to say about A&M. If it comes down at the end of the year and A&M is, uh, let's say, 11-1 uh, and one, and Notre Dame is 11-1 and one, and the SEC's already got three teams in the playoffs, Notre Dame's win over A&M might be the determining factor that keeps A&M out and gets Notre Dame in. Hey, Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I read this somewhere that Notre Dame is going to be starting five underclassmen on their offensive line. Three. Yeah, I mean, that whole thing is coming together. They, they got the offensive coordinator back who's been at LSU with uh, with Daniels. And so, and it, it sounds weird to say because I don't think, I think we all know, but I don't think the average, average college football fan knows how fast Riley Leonard is. Uh, so, the, it, there'll be some wrinkles in there, but it, it is behind a brand new offensive line, basically, against a head coach that knows your tendencies and is is going to build that AM defense, but he goes in there as well, uh, you know, getting to know these guys over the last couple of months. So, Tony, that, Tony uh, did, yeah. was, was, uh, was Leonard recruited to Notre Dame by uh, Brian Kelly? That I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't know because Leonard is at Duke. Leonard's coming over from Duke. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, what, I, what I'm hearing here now is Kelly may be able to provide Notre Dame uh, with some information about. Uh, a and M, as far as that goes, as far as being able, because remember, 
a loss by uh, A&M makes things a little bit better for LSU in the uh, makings of the playoffs. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, the, there's no way that uh, uh, A&M won't be prepared for what Notre Dame brings to the table. Uh, and obviously, Alco is, Al, Alco's been at both spots. Alco was at Notre Dame for a year uh, before the new regime came in as, as defensive coordinator. Then he moved on uh, to a, uh, uh, then he moved on to A&M. And then obviously he has been at Duke, and now he goes back to A&M to be the head man. Um, but I, I like A&M in that game, so I'll give that out as a as a free play because I'm not, you know, super gung ho about it. But I've already made a video about it, so it'll be out there and it'll be uh, on my Twitter account at uh, Mahid Nero. Uh, I also think that we should mention the 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 chaos for you know 20 years from now because I don't think any of us did. Jalen Daniels, if he wins the Heisman, then would see Jaden Daniels as a Heisman Trophy winner. That would be funny. Yeah, uh, that's everybody would remember where we are, twenty three and twenty four, where, where Jalen. That, that's Jaylen. another Fafita deal, though. As much as I love that, and I love, I love that kid, and I was so heartbroken that he got injured last year because that, that Kansas could imagine what they could have done with him. That he's on Kansas, and uh, that's that's going to hold him back. But I love it. I like that pick. Uh, by and, the way, Kyle, my, uh, my last little note um, is uh, is yeah. Be, I, because I, I didn't remember this either, and I have already written up some preview stuff and, and kind of uh, dived into some stuff. I don't rem- I did not remember that Boston College almost beat Florida State, and Thomas Castellanos is back. He's a he's their quarterback. He's very slight of frame, but he's faster than most uh, quarterbacks in this country. He's, he's one of the um, there's like three or four of them out there that have UCF ties. So I, I know their games all really well. You got Dylan Gabriel at Oregon, Castellanos at BC, Mikey Keene at Fresno State, all really dynamic quarterbacks that happened to start their careers at UCF and transferred out. Um, you know, it's uh, Gus Malzahn picked somebody else over them. But it, it's, uh, it, yeah, I think that there's no way that anybody that watched Florida State not live up to the hype because the reason why I picked them and why a lot of people uh, walked away dejected from that game uh, on Saturday was the offensive and defensive lines for Florida State was supposed to be the strength of that team. Georgia Tech pushed them around. So uh, certainly Tony, Boston Tony, College. Tony, you, you remember last year you, remen- you mentioned Florida State, Boston College, how close the game was. Yeah, 31-30. Really- oh, I'm sorry? I think it was 31-30, 30-29, something like that. Yeah, it, uh, no, it was it was more of a two-score game. And, and the reason why is I'm setting up for the scenario here is Florida State had a lead real late in the game. Florida State was taking a knee. The next time after they took a knee, they faked a knee and they threw for a touchdown pass to rub it in on Boston College. And believe me, I'm sure Boston College remembers that, that move that – I don't have no idea on God's green earth why Florida State would have done something like that, especially when they knew they were on their schedule the next year. But that's the case going into this football game. There's a lot of angriness inside of Boston College over what Florida State did and rubbed it into them last year. By the that, way, that, well, that, that, that I think was another game because yeah, FSU Boston College was 31-29. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah so no, that, that's another game that that, that happened, and I, I remember the situation because we had a, we had a couple of things with with, with the, we we had the, the knee that should have been taken in Miami. Right. Uh, well, maybe allowed. he didn't score, Tony. Maybe he didn't score, but he took the knee and he threw the ball instead. Was yeah. that that? That might have been. That, it, that. I, I I I don't remember that. I remember how close that was because it, FSU was a huge favorite, and uh, and. Yeah, yeah, BC legitimately stayed with them the entire game. But I don't remember, uh, I don't quite remember the, uh, the the final stages of that game. By the way, Mark, uh, I don't know if you have it in your database, but we have a couple of unusual teams this year before we continue to get all the final plays here. Uh, Utah State excused Blake Anderson as coach, I believe, in mid-July for some indiscretions. And uh, Jeff Tedford finally retired in July uh, from Fresno State for uh, health reasons. Uh, I'm wondering if there's any thought or any history. I'm looking, for example, I would probably won't make a big deal out of the Fresno State situation because the coach retired for reasons that were pretty much understandable. So I would think that Fresno State, if anything, might uh, have a little bit extra incentive to uh, uh, do something for their former coach under their, their, their new situation. But I have to think the situation at Utah State, uh, you know, maybe now, of course, it didn't happen with Northwestern last year, who went out on a great season after their uh, they, their situation with Fitzgerald. But I'm wondering if late coaching changes that occur, let's say during uh, after fall, 
after spring practice if there's any tendency as to how those teams do both early in the season and throughout that season. Good questions. Good food for thought, Andy. Uh, I don't know if your database had anything on that. No, it doesn't really no. because we don't tag late coaching changes per se. Uh, we'd have to tag it in the database that way and probably take a little bit of a, a lot of backtracking to do just that. All right. And then, uh, by the way, I'm going to have Kyle Kelly on from the On3 Network on the r Lads Football Network tomorrow live at 2 o'clock. So I'll get an opportunity to find out a lot about what's going on with Notre Dame going into the game this week. I already interviewed Olin Buchanan, who covers Texas A&M. That's also available on the r Lads uh, Football Network. Uh, YouTube channel. Um, he does a great job, Owen, and we talked a lot about the uh, Aggies. So uh, if you want to find out a little bit more about the Notre Dame-Texas A&M game, you could check out that channel and some of the interviews I conducted with those uh, really cool insiders. So uh, right now it looks like, Andy, I've got Georgia State, Jacksonville State, and Texas A&M. Uh, Tony, uh, you, you're going to go with Texas A&M and Boston College? For what? To Cover win the, the spreads? This weekend? Cover the spreads? Uh, A&M uh, to win, uh, I, I would actually say money line because you don't want to lay three uh, the money lines around one, in the 140 range. So, uh, And then, yeah, I would take the points with BC at this point. I still have okay. to dive in a little more, but uh, certainly first, first, in, first instinct would be to take the points. And Mark and, I, and Mark and I will have uh, a lot more to talk about tomorrow at 4 o'clock on the R Lads Football YouTube channel. We're going to preview week one in college football. So we'll go over picks, analysis, and so forth. Matter of fact, Mark and I will do some uh, NFL talk with Ryan Dunleavy of the New York Post at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, both of those shows are going to be live. Um, but just quickly, I just want to point out a few things regarding the games this week that interest me. Tomorrow night, North Dakota State at Colorado. Now, this could be a really good uh, underdog pick to keep an eye on because North, North Dakota State has won nine FCS titles since uh, 2011. They lost the semis last year. They lost the championship game in 2022. And we know Colorado is just a mystery team. We have no idea what to expect from them. They could beat TCU last year in the opener, and they could lose to North, North Dakota State this year in the opener. It wouldn't surprise us. Um, very interested to see Max Brosmer, the New Hampshire uh, big-time FCS quarterback, and how he performs on Thursday night in his opener uh, at home against North Carolina. Um, and uh, South Dakota State, speaking of SCF's teams, they're the two-time FCS champs, and they start the season at Oklahoma State at Saturday at 2 o'clock. You think Oklahoma State regrets scheduling South Dakota State? They probably did this about five or six years ago, right. not thinking that the, they're a 10-point favorite. They're a Big 12 favorite team as a 10-point home favorite against an FCS team. I don't know what you guys think about uh, that type of line. It's a good well, test if you pass it. There's a lot of respect in there for the F FCS team because Oklahoma State is really kind of loaded this year. Yeah. And uh, I think the, the odds makers know exactly what Oklahoma State's up against this week. I, I, my, my two cents on North Dakota State, obviously they're going to be prepared for this game, but I just don't know how you replicate a talent like Shador Sanders in, you know, with, your, with your scout team QB. And that that that's the the one obstacle with you know there are a lot of people saying North Dakota State outright, which is possible, obviously, uh, especially with how porous Colorado's offensive line was last year. But you know Sanders, if he's on his game and stays healthy, he's going to be something that North Dakota State has not seen. Let me throw this out there real quick, guys. Uh, you mentioned uh, Tony mentioned about A and M on the money line. If Jim Feist were sitting on the show with us, he'd be the first to bring that out because he's a real strong advocate of, uh, rather than laying uh, two or three points in a football game, he'll play the money line instead. Mm -hmm. And that would be a case in point for Texas A&M this particular week, not to get hung by the number, but just to win the football game. Yeah, I guess there's always a big difference between what that three could be, because sometimes it could be 140, and sometimes right. it could be 170, uh, depending on what team it is. Yeah. I mean, how far would you go personally, Mark? Are you like Jim and just do it 100% of the time, or are you going to you going to do it depending on whether it's 140 or 170? I'll lay a favorite up to two and a half in a, on a money line. I won't go to three because, like you said, there's too many options with threes out there. You know, it could be three juiced. Uh, if it's three plus, you can look at a money line that way. But uh, generally, they're juiced because they're popular. Uh, but I will play Jim's theory of short favorites, in this case of less than three on a money line, 
if you like the football team. And, speak and I'll often go with underdogs, NFL and college, especially in the NFL. If I like an underdog getting under three, part of the play will be on the money line. Uh, I'll also do that at plus at plus three as well, but my percentage on the plus three, I'll take more with the plus three than I will on the money line. And on the plus one and a half to two and a half, I'll generally have a little bit more on the money line than I will on the points. But I'll usually be playing both when I like those underdogs, those short-priced underdogs. And speaking of two and a half, uh, I, I like both Miami schools at two and a half. Miami uh, at Florida and Miami of Ohio at Northwestern. So... Uh, I just think if Miami is going to be as good as um, I'm, I am personally predicting, then uh, they just have to get off to a, a good start to beat Florida because they're just a more talented team. Um, but uh, that's going to be a really interesting game because uh, those are two uh, head coaches that have a lot of pressure on them to win that football game. Well, speaking about dogs, Greg, uh, I'm going to throw out what I call a big, ugly dog. I call these buds big ugly dogs and they're ugly because there aren't too many people that are going to want to bet on these teams but there's a bud or a big ugly dog out there this week that i played both plus the points and straight up on a money line and it's georgia state against georgia tech and you know we all know about georgia tech and what they did last week and where they're coming back from from dublin with no rest so forth and yada 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 You've got a Georgia State football team. This is the redheaded stepchild inside the state of Georgia taking on Georgia Tech, who's all about themselves this week and reading everything that they did. And Georgia State, they're the visiting team in this matchup, but they're only two miles away from the, uh, the stadium here. Uh, two miles away. It's not much of a road trip at all for Georgia State, who's going to come with everything they've got. So put me down for my big, ugly dog on Georgia State. Yeah, Georgia State uh, does have a new coach this year, so it's going to be interesting to see um, how uh, that transition works. they got a head coach by the name of Del McGee. He's going to be the new head coach at Georgia State. So what a great way to start off your career there because we have seen Georgia State, that program, uh, do some uh, interesting uh, things, including when they upset Tennessee. Uh, back in 2019 in the opening game of the season as a 26-point dog back in 2019. So they've done it before. Yes, they have. And, and, uh, and by the way, Georgia State, again, is one of those teams that have been focusing on Georgia Tech all summer, whereas Georgia Tech was preparing for Florida State. And Georgia State, uh, this one's on the road, but they have winnable games. Ne uh, the next. Uh, they, they play their next four games all at home, winnable games against Chattanooga and Vanderbilt in that two weeks. So, uh they're certainly, uh, which by the way, and if you can, if you're able to play those FCS games, if Georgia State happens to win this week, up that pulls the upset, I wouldn't be adverse against uh, playing Chattanooga against them next week. You mentioned Dell, the head coach at Georgia State, uh, the new head coach. He's a master recruiter. He was at Georgia, and now he's coming to Georgia State to play Georgia Tech. I would kind of think he might know a little bit about the players in this Georgia Tech <laughs> yeah. roster. Yeah. Well. Good point. It looks like the line of that game is getting close to crossing over the key number of 21 and a half as well. I'm showing it open to uh, 20 and a half. There's a bunch of 21s out there right now, and there's about one or two 21 and a halves. So you may want to hold off to see if that line crosses over that key number and then grabbing the 21 and a half when you can. My question, Victor, is these lines have been out for a long time, so was that 20 opening before or after the game against uh, Florida State? Uh, we, we, I think we did see that line go down a little bit and then come back up after the, uh, uh, after the, uh, the win over Florida State. I can't tell with the website that I'm on. It only shows an opener of 20 and a half, and there's uh, oh, half the sportsbooks out there already have it up to minus 21. Not surprising based on the knee-jerk reaction. I would give that a very close Ireland. look. I would, I would like to see that go to 21 and a half and then keep a very close look to see if it makes it to 22. And I wouldn't be surprised if it does. Yeah. All right, Mark. Okay, uh, guys, I, we're going to put the final reps in the show. I was going to share some Florida with you, but I don't want to rain on uh, Greg's Miami of Florida parade here <laughs> this particular week. <laughs> yeah, I already know where you stand on the crystal ball, so... Yeah, on the crystal okay. ball, 
Exactly. He's going to be the he's going to be the Jim Harbaugh of, of 2024 for Mark. Well, Mark's oh, happy because uh, Mario just hired in the off season a time management coach. Oh, there to you watch go. Watch the clock because while he's a great recruiter, he's not a good uh, game day coach. I'm sure Mark will back me up on that one. But he's now got a guy that he can look to uh, at the end of the game to manage his clock correctly. Well, let's hope he's looking at a digital clock and not an analog clock where he might get hypnotized. <laughs> Great point, Andy. <laughs> hey, and also leave you with this this thought, Greg. Forty and one. Forty and one. Uh oh. That's Florida's record in home openers. Okay, straight up. How many of them were against FBS teams? <laughs> well, how many of them, more importantly, were against Mario Cristobal? That's the question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How many of them were under Steve Spurrier? Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Remember, he but, took over a horrible program at Florida build it up and it sustained that success for the better part of 20 years but it's still the swamp it is and it's opening day and anything can yes, happen you know i read also i think we put this in the newsletter this week that florida has had three losing seasons in a row now that's the first time since 1945 46 mm -hmm. and 47 that's been a long time between drinks of losing water for the florida gators I was talking to Gary Furman uh, on uh, the, uh, the other day who covers the Canes for Canesport.com, and he said that when he was going over the game with the Florida people, they said that Montrell Johnson, uh, Florida's uh, big-time running back, who was, of course, uh, with uh, uh, Napier at Louisiana, uh, is a little bit banged up, and they're not even sure if he's going to play, so keep an eye on that. Check and find out before game time if Montreal Johnson will start because that is a major part of what uh, uh, a Napier wants to do. He's, he's a coach that wants to play physical football. He wants to run the ball. Uh, and if he doesn't have Montreal Johnson, that uh, that could be a really big loss. That's a good point, Greg. Real good. Okay, guys, that's going to put the final wraps in this edition of Mark Lawrence Against the Spread. Great show today. I want to thank our cast of experts for joining us on the show. Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. Victor King from the Totals Tip Sheet. Tony Mejia, Playbook Experts and Contributor to the Sporting News. And our primetime producer, Greg DePalma from Primetime Sports. For all the guys, once again, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always.